technology and sustainability really go together. Um, you know, they're not two different things. Um, we use one to drive the other. Today I will speak with Hanneke Faber. She is president of Global Food and Refreshment at Unilever and member of the executive team. She has more than 25 years of international experience in the consumer goods and retail sector and was most recently named as one of the most powerful women in the world. Welcome, Hanneke. Thanks, Alexandra. Fun to be here. I'd actually like to start with a great topic. So most recently, uh, you've set a very ambitious new future food ambition. Can you explain a bit more about it? Yeah, of course. So um, we just, yeah, just a couple of weeks ago, we set a new ambition for our foods business, which we call Future Foods. Um, the reason we're doing that is that the global food system is broken. And as a big foods player, we have a responsibility to help fix it. And why do I say it's broken? It's broken because there is a billion people in the world that are hungry. There is in two billion people who are overweight or obese. Um, and the concern about that has heightened during COVID because it is a comorbidity. A third of all the food we produce in the world gets wasted, um, so never makes it into our mouths. And finally, the foods industry is responsible for 25% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. So just a lot to be improved on. And again, as a big player, we have a responsibility. So there's an, we, we really made four new commitments. The first one is that we're going to sell a billion euros of plant-based meat and dairy replacements, um, which is kind of a scary goal. We don't quite know how to get there, but we'll figure it out. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the second thing is that we're going to half our food waste um, between factories and shelf. The third is that we're going to double the number of products with what we call positive nutrition, which means a significant amount of macronutrients like vegetables or proteins or micronutrients like vitamins and minerals. And finally, we're going to commit to continuing to reduce salt, sugar and calories in our products. Amazing. Those are really concrete goals. How do you include sustainability in your goals and how do you make it actionable? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. And I think Unilever, um, you know, over the last 10 years or so, um, has kind of developed this theory of change of, you know, what role can we play in the bigger system? Our purpose is making sustainable living commonplace. Um, we feel we have a role there, but clearly we can't, you know, change the world by ourselves. So it's really three steps and these future foods commitments you should see in those in that context as well. Three steps. The first step is get your own house in order. Um, and that's what these commitments are really about. You know, I can talk about the world's food system all I want, but if our own house at Unilever is not in order, then I should really shut up and get to work. Um, so that's step one. Step two is leveraging our brands. Um, we have these wonderful big brands, um, you know, a brand like Knorr in my portfolio is in more than 3 billion households um, every year. So we reach lots of people. So how do we leverage our brands to help make sustainable living commonplace? And then the third is, you know, hopefully we can also influence um, others Um, by getting out on the edge um, and collaboration with partners is absolutely critical. Uh, and, and, and I was also wondering, for example, also when you talk about waste in the food chain, so I could imagine that technology, data, artificial intelligence play a role there. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, absolutely. A food waste is actually an interesting example of that. Um, because if it was easy to eliminate food waste, we would have already done it because it costs money, right, for businesses. So businesses don't want to waste food. Um, so if it was easy, we would have already done it, but it's not easy. Um, we have significant waste in our factories and we have significant waste when we produce products, when we basically when we plan wrong, when we produce products that we end up not selling. Um, and I think in both of those areas, um, technology can absolutely play a role. So in our factories, that's that's ever more sensitive robots so that the ice cream basically doesn't run off the line when we do a line changeover, which happens. So robotics play a big role in our plans. 
Um, and in terms of planning, of course, um, you know, analytics and AI need to help us to plan better so that we only produce what we absolutely know we're going to sell and that people are actually going to eat. Yeah. And are you already taking action in that area? Of, of Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And again, by setting some clear goals, the actions will accelerate. I think there's also another um, hot topic in terms of transparency in the food chain, that you, that you want to know where your food comes from. Are you also yeah. busy on that topic? Absolutely. So um, transparency, especially in terms of sustainable sourcing, is a really hot topic for us. Um, so everyone wants to know where their tomatoes, but especially where their palm oil, for example, comes from and whether it was sustainably sourced or whether, you know, half a forest disappeared in order to get their product in your hands. So again, technology plays a huge role there um, in certifying that um, agricultural inputs were sustainably sourced. So we're now using drones um, to check on our suppliers year round. Because in the past, you know, we used to send a guy there and once a year he'd go into the palm forest in Indonesia and do a certification. And then, you know, he'd leave and come back next year and God only knows what happened in the meantime. <laughs> that's not entirely true, but, you know, that's how yeah. it would work. Yeah. Now with drones and camera lytics, um, we can see that estate year round uh, and that farm year round. And that really, really helps in terms of eliminating deforestation, which is why as a company... We're committed that by 2023, we'll be 100% deforestation free. And that's really thanks to technology. Well, I think it's really inspiring how, you know, audacious uh, you are in terms of setting these goals uh, and using technology. No, and technology together. and sustainability really go together. Um, you know, they're not two different things. Um, we use one to drive the other. So, and now let's get to your customers of your division. Of course, I think you have two types of, let's say, B2B customers. On one hand, you have uh, the retailers, the supermarkets, and on the other hand, you have a whole range of customers, restaurants, hotels, ice cream parlors, gas stations, leisure parks. Well, you know them better than I do. <laughs> uh, now let's focus on the second category. Um, what are you, your plans to serve these customers more digitally? Or is there a need? Would, would they like to be served more digitally? Yeah, um, yes. And of course, that's become very, very clear this year. Technology has really helped us serve them this year and, and stay in touch with our customers this year. Going forward, I think that will only become more important. Um, so we call it digital selling, which is we're, we're not going to entirely move away from human selling, of course. But it will be a combination of digital selling where we have Um, a single view of each customer based on where they are, who they are, what they've bought in the past, what they need, who their consumers are, um, so that we can better predict what they'll need um, and help them get that in the fastest, most affordable ways. Um, so that's that's something where, you know, I'm sure we'll be working on for many more years to come, but it's a big priority for us. Yeah, so in also the way that you're saying it, it's of course crucial to get the right data in on the consumer and that the sales force is being helped on actually using that data to help the customers better. Absolutely. That, that in the end is what it's all about. You know, we want to serve that customer better. Yeah. Um, and um, I think the combination of a salesman or woman and the right data and digital systems that he or she can use, that's, that will be get the best service yeah. versus one or the other. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, to do so is a, is a big change for you. You have a very big global organization. So how are you going to get them along in this change? Yeah, yeah. I think this is one of the things you and Spark always tell us, you know, uh, one thing is the technology, but that's the easy part. Um, now you got to get everyone to embrace the technology and to actually use it, including the customers themselves. Um, 
So, um, so yeah, big, big, big program. And, and we have a lot of focus on the culture change and the, and the habit change that people need and people want it, especially our best people. They, they want to change. So, um, so that, that's not the issue. It's just, you know, learning the skills and getting into new habits. Um, but I'm encouraged, um, you know, in some of the markets where we're furthest along, we're really starting to see the first benefits and people are enjoying the new ways of working and they're finding more leads um, because they now have all the data of their, you know, the region they serve. So they, they find new leads and they also in customers, they already serve thanks to the, do the data, to the CRM, to the campaigning tools. Um, they're finding that they can sell um, more products um, more relevant products, because that's important. It's not just about more selling more products, but more relevant products to customers they already serve. So, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're encouraged. Yeah. Do you also see that actually the, uh, the way of working uh, changes, uh, for example, between marketing and sales? Have you seen it already? Yeah, I, I think um, increasingly we're seeing marketing and sales blur. Um, You know, we need our salespeople to be marketeers and we need our marketing people to sell. So I don't know that five years from now we'll still have marketing and sales um, because with the digital technology, they are really blurring. And that's, again, part of the change we need to drive. Yeah, and, and also the type of, of competences, huh? because we often see that, uh, and you also know that because you've been in digital very long time, as I know, um, You also need to have your data very close with you because, of course, yeah. uh, uh, we also see with some customers that they put data somewhere completely else and they put competences, they outsource it. Yeah, no, I think it's, that's very, very dangerous um, because if we don't understand our own data and don't have that near and dear to our hearts, we're never going to be able to use it to serve our customers and consumers best. So, um, so no, you know, I... I think every com for every company, but certainly for Unilever, we will need to bring IT and technology much closer to the heart of how we do business. And that's certainly one of the things I'm trying to drive at Unilever, which, which of course, even 10 or and certainly 20 years ago, maybe wasn't so necessary for a company like Unilever. You know, IT was kind of this dusty thing in the corner, um, but it can't be today. Yeah. Every time you get customer data in, you want to digest it and then improve on it. So how do you see improving the speed of learning at Unilever? Yeah. No, I think that's, again, why the integrated teams and almost integrated people, so the marketing and sales blur, are so important. Um, so teams, indeed, need to see the data come in on a daily basis and then be able to act on it. Um, and if they have to go through five layers and functions, it'll be way too late and the data will be old. Um, so that's certainly something, you know, we're, we're driving again in the markets. This is most important because we're serving, you know, the Mexicans and the Kazakhstanis and the Indonesians, which you can't do necessarily from Rotterdam with the same insights. But we need those integrated teams there. So, um, so that's that's part of the change to digital selling for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And as yeah. you already mentioned, uh, well, we are allowed to support you. Uh, what was most valuable in our support? Um, yeah, a number of things. So um, you supported us um, with the kickoff of this whole uh, digital selling in food service channels. Um, I think you brought a really um, organized uh, approach from the start, which is helpful because teams who are in the business and who've never done this before, um, you know, can go a little bit, oh, I don't, I have no idea where to start. You don't know what you don't know, really. And you guys have done this before. So the fact that you came with a template was super helpful. Your starting point really helped them define where were the big opportunities Um, because we, you know, the away from home channel, as, as you said earlier, uh, there's, there's like a thousand sub channels in every country. So you could go do, you know, literally 10,000 things tomorrow. Yeah. Um, but your methodology helped us say, okay, these are the big opportunities that we should focus on first. Um, so I thought that was really helpful as well. 
great and great to be able to support. Uh, mm. And of course, um, what we also see a lot in all the clients is that, of course, to make digital transformation happen, uh, investments are needed first before revenue come. So um, how do you convince your stakeholders uh, to make this happen? Yeah. Well, I do think it's a multi-year plan. So you do need to think through, you know, uh, what kind of revenue, which is why the opportunity identification is so important. So what kind of extra revenue am I going to get from this? What kind of efficiencies will I get from this as well? Um, because there is work that no longer needs to happen once you get this done. And then indeed, okay, what, what's the upfront investment I need to make? So putting that together at minimum at the back of an envelope and saying, okay, it kind of makes sense if I'm going to spend X, I'll get this much more revenue and I'll get these efficiencies. It's always a leap of faith. Any business case is a leap of faith, but, um, but that's how we approach it. And we're in it for the long term. Uh, Unilever has been here for more than 100 years. Um, we hope to be here for another 100 years. So if it doesn't pay out in the next week, that's okay. Well, I think that's very crucial what you say, the, also the longer term view, because we really see the difference between, also, you know, between our clients who are making this happen or not is the longer term view. So where do you think that diversity will come in in the next five years to achieve all the goals? Yeah, so again, at Unilever, we're proud that this year we reached our target of 50% female managers. So that was a target I had nothing to do with. It was, it was set back in 2010 by, uh, by Paul Pullen and his team at the time. And at the time, Unilever had 35% female managers. Um, so it seemed like a ways off and there was tons of excuses they probably made for why that was the case. But they set the target and we have delivered it this year. So we're now at 50% female managers, which is great. Great. Um, yeah. And now we need to also get to 50% at the very highest level of management, where we're now at about, I think we're high 30s this year. Um, so, um, um, but, but, you know, I think gender parity is an absolute must and it will be good for everyone. Um, more diverse teams do get better results. And it's better for all our daughters and sisters and friends as well. Absolutely. I completely agree. And mm -hmm. you as a leader, I think you're really a leader. What type of leader are you, you know, to contribute to this? <laughs> well, I, I, I try to be really clear with, with people on my, what my purpose is. Um, and my purpose is to do well by doing good. Um, so they're not two different things for me. Um, I want to do well. I want to win in the market. Um, but I want to do that by doing good. Um, so by doing things like selling more plant-based products, reducing waste, selling more positive nutrition. So, um, you know, and I, I hope that my people, therefore, also, of course, want to win in the market, but they want to do that by doing good. So hopefully, um, you know, I can make that come to life. Well, and I think also it also helps, of course, that you've been a top athlete. You also write it in your bio. So where does this add to how you see yourself as a leader? I think sports is a great base for, you know, any, anyone, honestly, but certainly for, for people in leadership roles. Um, it teaches discipline and hard work, which, trust me, you know, leadership is not glamorous. Um, you know this well, etc. <laughs> I it's hard work. <laughs> it's hard it work. is just hard work. So, but um, certainly, I, I was a. So, my sport was diving. You know, when you when you you have to get up every morning at five thirty and get into the pool at six a.m. and it's cold and it's dark and you don't really want to do that and you certainly don't want to do a reverse three and a half at six a.m. in the morning. Well, but you do it every day again. So that discipline, I think, is super helpful. And then, of course, also the, 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 the thrill of winning and the acceptance that you don't win them all. A uh, very remote question. Were you never afraid with the diving? <laughs> yeah. I, just, I, just, yeah. I would be well, so just, afraid. Yeah, diving is a really scary sport, right? <laughs> I mean, you're standing 10 meters high in the air yeah. um, and you got to hurl yourself off that platform at 55 kilometers an hour and hope for the best. So um, it's a thrill. And I miss that sometimes because obviously you can't dive once you're done. That would be very dangerous. 
Um, but again, it's a real, it's really helpful for a later career. You know, people sometimes ask me before like a big speech or something, aren't you nervous? <laughs> Compared to standing up at 10 meters and having to do a reverse two and a half, a speech is nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm grateful to diving. I can completely imagine. No, I think it's just so incredible that you did that. So I just wanted to ask you once. So uh, thank you very much, Hanneke. Very nice speaking to you. Thank you. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs>